Hello and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and you are watching part one of my video, uh, The Renaissance Stage, which is an introduction to early modern English theater. So just to give you an overview of why this is an important topic, um, what we're really considering here is what's often considered the golden age of English theater from the 1570s roughly to 1642 when the public theaters were closed down by the English government. And the popular theater was um, very widespread, very popular, but it was also very controversial. And it appeared in multiple forms. There's, of course, the public theater that we know about. That's what we're most familiar with. However, there were also very popular schoolboy companies, companies made up of, of students that performed plays. And there were also court masks, which were aristocratic entertainments performed in um, noble courts by professional actors and by the aristocrats themselves. And of course, the theater of this period is responsible for many, many famous authors, um, including, of course, William Shakespeare, um, as well as his, his rival and friend Ben Jonson and Christopher Marlowe and dozens of others. Part one of this video lecture is on the medieval origins of Renaissance drama. So what are the major characteristics of medieval English drama? Well, first is that the subject matter was almost entirely religious, either directly scriptural or talking about religious and theological issues. And this leads us to its purpose. It was didactic in purpose. That means most plays were uh, expressly intended as a kind of education in morals, ethics, and uh, appropriate religious knowledge for the common audience. The performers were not quite the professional actors that we have later in the Renaissance, but many of them were semi-professional performers, bards, and also amateur actors. Sometimes citizens themselves would take part in these performances because they were often related to uh, city events, civic events, social events, uh, festivals, things like that. So there was not so much a divide between the professional and the audience. Many audience members could actually be performers themselves. One of the major types of drama of the medieval period are what we call morality plays. These were allegorical tales of good versus evil, very straightforward in a sense, in terms of their morality. Um, and they contained abstract characters that are not really people, but personifications of moral attributes and so forth. And we see here on the left um, uh, an image from the, the uh, cover page of Every Man, a morality play. And as you can see in the graphic, on the left we have a human, on the right we have a figure of death, a demonic figure. So very obvious the kind of stakes that are at play in a morality play. It's about life and death, good and evil, humans fighting against death and suffering, and our evil tendencies. Speaking of every man, let's use that as an example of the typical morality play. The title tells us a little bit about it. It's about the character of every man, who obviously represents humanity. And every man must balance his account in God's ledger book. And these are not metaphors, these are actual things. God has a ledger book that he puts all our good and bad deeds in, and every man has to make sure that it balances up so that he'll go to heaven. And he has a number of friends like kindred, goods, beauty, strength, wit, etc. But they all desert him. They all leave him on his journey in life. But his friend Knowledge instructs him that he needs to go to confession. He needs to go meet this person confession. That is, he must acknowledge his sinfulness and insufficiency before God. And the only friend that accompanies him all the way until his death and to the grave is good deeds his friend Good Deeds, and Good Deeds is the only one who can balance his account. So you can see the obvious allegory about how to behave, about what the proper morality is. The moral lesson of this play is that it's demonstrating the essential corruption of humankind, that we are all tainted by original sin, and it shows that through our representative sinful behavior, how we get seduced by goods, that is, material items, how we get seduced by fellowship and enjoying our friends, how we get seduced by our own strength and beauty, but none of these things last. 
And these are all performed, these different characters, uh, these sinful characters, were called commonly the vice. That's the name of the actor or the type of character that performs them. And they were very seductive, entertaining figures of wrongdoing and worldly pleasure. Obviously, a character like beauty or a character like fellowship or friendship has to be fun, has to be enjoyable, has to be seductive on stage so that you understand as an audience member how enticing evil is even though they're eventually defeated by good deeds. So it shows us the weakness of human nature and also the punishment of sin, of what happens to us if we follow after these vices. But on the other hand, it also models the correct behavior for salvation, that we need to have a certain disdain for worldly goods, that we understand them as temporary, as passing, and that instead of focusing on our worldly goods, our earthly pleasures, we need to look towards what are we doing to balance our account for God? What are we doing to make ourselves holy, to try to overcome our sinfulness and move towards God's love? And it shows the reward for following religious doctrine, how if you are good, how if you perform good deeds and so forth, you will ultimately be rewarded with God's love and his grace. Another important and popular type of uh, drama during the medieval period were what are called mystery plays or sometimes called miracle plays. And these are plays that were performed yearly as part of citywide festivals in the various towns throughout England. And as we see here, um, what's interesting about them, technologically speaking, is that they were performed on mobile stages that traveled throughout town. They would be wheeled about through, through town, so the whole city would take part in a dramatic festival watching these different plays. Now, what were the mystery or miracle plays? Well, they were collections of very short scenes, usually not no longer than a few minutes, um, and they were each unique to a particular city, so we sometimes call them city cycles. And we have uh, uh, some mostly extant cycles from the city of York, from the city of Wakefield, from the city of Chester, and a few other fragments. They were authored anonymously. We don't have explicit authors for them, so we just talk about the York master or the Wakefield master, who seems to be the unified voice that composed most or all of the uh, plays for each cycle. And the plays themselves were covered religious subject matter, and they covered biblical and extra biblical stories from creation to the apocalypse. So both the stories that are in the Bible as well as the stories that have risen up popularly to supplement the explicit tales in the Bible. And so they had a very obvious didactic purpose to teach biblical stories, to teach scripture to the illiterate masses. Most people couldn't read, so this is how they learned how God created the world, all the various major stories of the old patriarchs, the story of Jesus, cru crucifixion, resurrection, etc. They learned it by watching these plays, as well as, of course, going to church. Now, the mystery plays, each one of them within a cycle, would have been performed by uh, an individual craft guild, or sometimes a couple craft guilds working together. And what a guild is, if you're not familiar with that term, it's an association of merchants or artisans, tradespeople, basically, that all work in a common trade. So tanners, carpenters, dressmakers, barbers, things like that. And the guilds were early versions of what we have today, like unions, professional associations, monopolies even. Uh, they function to manage trade within a city. They resolve disputes between members. They also supported members if one of them fell on economic difficulties, so they provided social welfare as well as economic uh, uh, governance. They kept trade secrets, so if a particular technique had been developed within the city, they made sure people outside of that didn't learn that technique. They represented the interests of their members to government. So they did a lot of different things that, that now unions and so forth and lobbyists perform in modern society. And guilds were, intriguingly enough, also known as mysteries. And that points us to an intriguing overlap in the meaning of the word mystery when it's applied to these plays. 
On the one hand, mystery comes from the idea of miracle, similar root, similar root in Latin. And a miracle is something inexplicable. It's a supernatural event that is performed by some deity, by God in the case of Christian theology. And it's a mystery that can't be understood. You cannot understand miracles. You simply must believe in them, according to most theological doctrines. So that's what we see. For example, we can't understand how God created the universe. We just have to have faith that he did. But mystery also derives from the word ministerium, which is, that is, a craft or a skill, some sort of activity that requires trained skills in order to administer or perform. So in this sense, a mystery is something that's unknown only to a few, those people who minister it, the craftsmen. And it's kept secret from the public as a means both to protect the public from things they shouldn't know or can't understand, but also, of course, as a means of power, as a means of keeping a certain amount of power to oneself. And we can see an overlap between the craft guilds and, of course, the priests, the priestly class who were ministers of the faith to the people. And so that leads us perhaps to ask, what sort of connections might there be between a guild and the play that it's performing? So here are some examples from the York Cycle of the guilds and the plays that they performed. So the plasterers, people who build things, who use plaster to make things, buildings, they did the first five days of creation. That makes sense. The coopers, people who made wooden casks, they did the fall of man, perhaps a dark uh, connection there. Uh, the irony of the fall of man into death, so they need a cask maker. The shipwrights built, did building the ark, makes sense. Fishers and mariners did the story of Noah and his wife. The goldsmiths do the story of the three kings visiting baby Jesus, because, of course, gold was one of the gifts they brought to salute him as king. The barbers did the baptism of Jesus. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. The bakers doing the Last Supper, very significant there, right? The Last Supper, the last time that bread is broken between Jesus and his followers, and the model for the Eucharist. So the bakers did that. The shearmen, that is the people who would shear sheep, cut the, the wool off of sheep. They do the story of Christ being led to, the, to Calvary, where he will be crucified. Very powerful connection there, because of course Christ is the Lamb of God, who is sacrificed for humanity within Christian theology. Uh, the carpenters doing the resurrection, the scribes or scriveners doing Doubting Thomas, textile dealers doing Judgment Day, and there's, of course, many others. But it's interesting, the connections that you see, and it's not just about, well, we're shipwrights, so of course we're going to do building the ark, but it's also about the connection between everyday life and the work that we as individuals do as a sort of holy echo of God's narrative, of God's story. So these plays connected the everyday world to the divine. Over the next few slides, I just want to show you some photos that I took in 2006 when I was in York in England, and they performed some of their uh, medieval plays from the York City Cycle as part of an early music festival. The Creation. The Fall of Lucifer. The Fall of Man. Herod and the Magi. Herod, incidentally, was famous as being a very overblown, violent, over-the-top character in performance. So in Midsummer Night's Dream, Bottom says that he will out-Herod Herod. He's going to be a big, tough character.
and the final judgment. Now, imagine yourself an illiterate medieval peasant. You have no experience of the world beyond your remote English town. All you've ever known is your peasant life of working on this little farm in York. You've never been beyond there. So imagine you've seen something like those photos, something like the plays that have been depicted in those photos. What would you learn from that? What effect would that have on your understanding of the world, of the universe, and your place in it? How much is just conveyed just by the visual aspects of those plays without even hearing the words? And what would that do to you? How would that socialize you? How would that help you understand what your duties were as a good Christian? Now, there were other medieval sources besides the morality plays and the mystery plays. There were various interludes and brief scenes, improvisations, court entertainments, things like the Commedia dell'arte from Italy being imported over. So short scenes that are approaching the longer forms of the Renaissance drama, but not quite there yet. And they could be and they could be dramatic. They could be tragic. They could be romantic. They could be comic. Um, and they were performed by semi-professional actors traveling troops of entertainers, bards, things like that. They would go to pubs or manor houses of, of wealthy nobles out in the countryside and perform these little things for entertainment. Um, and also there were folk celebrations. Uh, it was a large part of English countryside culture, English rural culture, the various celebrations for harvest and different times of the year, May Day and things like that. So when these were filled with dancing, pageantry, the common people getting together to celebrate, eat and drink together. And these were a very important and rich part of the uh, public uh, performance tradition in, rent in medieval England um, and that fed into the Renaissance drama tradition. And I give a little bit more information about them if you're interested in my video, The World of Midsummer Night's Dream, which is also here on YouTube. Let's take a break before we go on to talking about the end of medieval drama. So now on to part two of this video lecture, the end of medieval drama. Let's look at how medieval drama was suppressed and pushed aside so that Renaissance, the Renaissance stage could take over. So perhaps the most important historical context here is the Protestant Reformation. And by the mid 16th century, the 1530s to the 1560s, it's taken hold in England. And a few important things to note about Protestantism. It emphasizes the individual's authority in matters of faith, that the individual must accept Christ, his or herself, that all scriptural interpretation is done through the internal voice of the Holy Spirit, that is, the individual reads the scripture and hears within themselves what it means, rather than being told what it means by a priest, and the idea of the priesthood of all believers, that is, every individual can speak directly to God or Christ, and there's no need for a priestly class to intercede on our behalf. There's no need to go to someone specially trained to talk to God. But there's an irony, there's a paradox at play. Despite this emphasis on individual freedom, and this was something that also was prominent in the counter-reformation of the Catholic Church, they also began to emphasize individual agency. But despite this, religious conflict within Europe, it just unleashed so much disorder and violence and religious and political authorities who often were the same person or the same group, or at least had overlapping uh, domains, they demanded increased conformity in practice and public behavior because of the extreme amount of disorder that was unleashed because of religious uh, dispute. So even though there's this new emphasis all across the religious spectrum on individual agency and individual faith, there's also a desire to reinstate order in the face of what appears to be anarchy. And this is especially true in England. 
So in England, there was a suppression of the traditional folk festivals like May Day, um, all these harvest festivals, etc., because they reached back to a pre-Christian past. And so within the minds of the Protestant authorities, there was a connection to pagan rituals, to black magic, to the worship of false gods. Also, on a social aspect, on a social level, these folk rituals often dramatized a reversal of order. So they featured a lord of misrule who took over and the, the high were cast down temporarily and the low were made prominent during these festivals. And that was troubling to authorities for its potential political upheaval. So also a part of suppressing the traditional folk festivals was to prevent the organization of the disorganized poor. There was a long history of peasant revolt throughout Europe during this period over rights, over food, over starvation, over land rights, etc. And so we see how there's an interweaving of religious, political, and economic and social issues. So by suppressing these harvest rituals and harvest festivals, they prevented the poor from possibly getting together and organizing in en masse to counter, to protest their situation. The Protestants also suppressed the morality and mystery play traditions because of their explicit religious content. That may seem odd that a religious group is going to suppress a religious text, especially a Christian story, but it's because the morality and mystery plays were part of a Catholic culture and promoted Catholic doctrines that were rejected or at least controversial in the new Protestant faith. For example, the idea that good deeds would lead to salvation was rejected by and large by most Protestants. They did not believe that you could buy your way into heaven by doing good things for God. Also, they were controversial because of the direct representation of divine figures on stage. They would have God and angels and other such figures on stage. So that was controversial and there were accusations of idolatry. So we see how the religious changes weakened civic and local bonds as well as suppressing a particular type of art, a particular drama. They weakened the bonds that supported morality and mystery plays and that morality and mystery plays tried to reinforce through their ethical and didactic lessons. On the economic side, we also have during this period an increase in international trade as the beginnings of globalization and colonization are starting to occur. So there's more trade between nations and a growing power of financial merchants and credit in order to fund these more expensive international trading junkets. And so there is a weakening at the same time of traditional economic organizations like the mystery guilds in favor of pre-modern corporate style companies in favor of the kind of businesses that started to develop and define our modern society. So on the one hand, these economic organizations no longer had the, the finances or the power to support the costs of performances, even if they hadn't been suppressed by the, by the authorities. And this further goes to show how civic and local bonds were weakened by economic and religious changes and the interconnections between them social changes. The dissolution of the Catholic institutions like monasteries, nuns, various churches, things like that, that Henry VIII and his son Edward VI after him um, dissolved, weakened again further many local bonds. It eradicated the kind of traditional safety net that these institutions had provided for the poor and indigent, and again it further weakened the connections within local communities. So this also led to, or was part of, alongside economic changes, increased migration to the major city centers, especially London, which is, of course, where the Renaissance stage really took off in England. So again, we see weakened civic and local bonds as a result of social, economic, religious changes. That movement of people to London was combined with an increasing flow of money through key economic centers like London because of, of course, the growth in international trade. And this meant that there was an emergent middling sort of people, not yet called the middle class, but, but termed in this period and later the middling sort. So they had common origins. They weren't aristocrats, but they were urban. They lived in the city. They were more educated 
and they had disposable income. They had money to spend on goods and services, and that is of key importance. And jumping back sort of to framing this as a social change, because of the growth of this new middling sort, there's a both direct and indirect spread of education and new learning. More people are becoming literate, but also there's just sort of a general spread of education as those people percolate and circulate through the society. And with the suppression of the folk entertainments in older plays and the new disposable income of the newly educated merchant class, there's a desire for new forms of entertainment. So all of these things together lead us to the birth of and desire for a new Renaissance stage. We're almost at the end of this lecture, but I'd like you to consider something before I give you some specific questions. The medieval stage, as I've discussed it here, served a number of different functions in medieval English society. It educated individuals and the community in religious and moral doctrines, told them what they should believe. It bound together the community in the expression of shared values as well as shared fears. It provided an outlet for creativity, for expression, supported the local economy, united the civic body with the, with the business world, brought them together in a shared endeavor, and it connected human life and experience to the world of the divine. So when medieval drama was suppressed, those needs, those social needs, those cultural needs did not just disappear. So even though the suppression of medieval dramatic traditions paved the way for the emergence of the Renaissance stage, they also shaped the Renaissance stage because they burdened it with, burdened it with the need to try to fulfill some of these functions, but in a way that would be acceptable to the new order of the world, to a society, to an economy, to a culture that was radically changing. So how does the Renaissance stage perform the same functions or some of the same functions, but in a completely different way, in a completely, or not completely, but a largely different way and context? And of course, in its time, the traditions and styles that were were definitive of the Renaissance stage, itself became too dangerous and became considered the enemy of order. And so in 1642, the parliamentary forces in the first English Civil War shut down all the public theaters. So we have to think about this intriguing ambivalence on display. Art, and here in particular, the dramatic performative public art, plays conflicting roles within society. It both provides an opportunity for unity as well as dispute. It expresses what we have shared in terms of our values, but it also expresses and explores the areas where we might conflict and challenge and question each other. Now, if in the Renaissance, religious topics have become too sensitive to be directly portrayed on stage, how do Renaissance playwrights and Renaissance plays engage with the social and psychological consequences of religious upheaval in an indirect way with the questions that these upheavals raised and the problems and challenges that individuals faced in their daily life because of this upheaval? How do Renaissance plays deal with that indirectly? On the same topic, how do they address questions of religious doctrine and practice and the theological issues that lie beneath them without openly talking about it. If they can't talk directly about religious issues, how do they really, uh, in other words, satisfy our innate human need for an answer to the major questions of, as Douglas Adams put it, life, the universe, and everything? That's what we look to art for. So how do they do that if they can't talk directly about God? If traditional entertainments raise too many questions or contain too many representations of disorder, can we say that the Renaissance plays that we've read in the past, or the Shakespeare or others, do we see them as encouraging a greater trend towards conformity? In what ways? On the same topic, how do these plays represent the conflict between order and disorder? What terms do they use? What does that, what shape 
does that conflict take? And again on the same topic, are Renaissance plays and the public theater in general any less likely to encourage or provide the opportunity for the expression of dissatisfaction, anger, frustration? That is, are these any less likely to encourage the poor to riot or encourage people to question their government, question their authorities? Are they really more promoting of authority or of transgression and subversion and revolt? And last questions to consider, how do Renaissance plays demonstrate or represent the changes in the economic and social order? And in particular, the rise of new forms of business and the spread of learning, not just examples of them, not just allusions to new learning or things like that, but what does this do? How, what are the, the psychological, cultural effects of these changes? How is this transforming the world that we thought we knew and that we thought we had our place fixed in? How do the Renaissance plays deal with that social and cultural and economic upheaval? How do they represent the consequ consequences of an instability created by these changes? So what are the real effects, material in the real world, and the psychological effects of a new world order? And how do they show up in Renaissance plays? How are they represented in Renaissance drama? These are big questions that you're not going to have an answer to, but they're questions that I want you to think about as you read the plays that we're reading in this semester. So that's the end of our part one of lecture on the Renaissance stage. Next time on the Renaissance stage part two, I'll talk about the intellectual foundations of Renaissance drama, give you a little overview on the birth of the Elizabethan stage and the first theaters, and talk some about the theatrical practices in Renaissance England. Uh, if you have questions, of course, you know how to get in touch with me via email or phone. Otherwise, have a good week and enjoy yourself. I wish you the day you wish yourselves.